I recently came across an online magazine that's called bestlife.com. Clearly, that title does not represent truth in advertising. Consider the article entitled 21 Habits That Are Bad for the Environment and subtitled Ditch These Habits If You Want to Help Save the Planet and Reduce Your Carbon Footprint. Folks, the so-called advice found in this article left my jaw residing on the linoleum. Indeed, one so-called tip made the thank God I'm a biological man who identifies as a biological man. That's because bestlife.com urges females to give up using tampons and pads. Apparently, these products are killing Mother Earth too. Quote, over half of the population is made up of women, and most of those women will have their period almost every month for about 40 years, meaning we use a ton of feminine hygiene products that create non-recyclable byproducts. How much, you may be wondering? According to Julie Weigard Kajar, CEO and co-founder of Ruby Cup, the average person who has periods will use up to 12,000 disposable period products over the course of a lifetime. A menstrual pad contains the same amount of plastic as four carrier bags. A tampon takes 500 years to decompose. Swapping pads and tampons for reusable menstrual cups like Ruby Cup or period underwear from brands like Thinks and NYX can drastically minimize your negative impact on the environment, end quote. Uh, by the way, did you catch that line from the Ruby Cup CEO, quote, the average person who has periods, end quote, um, person? Uh, you mean woman, don't you? How woefully woke can you go, Julie? You are the chief executive officer of a feminine hygiene product company, and you're concerned that you might offend some transvestite out there who thinks he experiences menstruation? <laughs> Incredible. But more to the point, I googled Ruby Cup. Let's put it this way. If I was a biological woman identifying as a biological woman, there's no way I'd be using the Ruby Cup on a monthly basis. It's gross. This same bestlife.com article then goes on to tie itself into a Gordian knot of illogic. The author wants you to reduce meat consumption. That's de rigueur these days. But at the same time, the article warns people against importing stuff. Um, hello, I live in Canada. If I want to embrace a vegan diet a la Greta Thunberg, where do I get my bananas and pineapples and oranges? Or any number of fruits and vegetables that don't tend to flourish here, especially in the wintertime. And don't you dare suggest growing these edibles in greenhouses. You know, that whole greenhouse gas thingy. So maybe importing things that are unattainable domestically, maybe that isn't such a bad idea after all. How dare you? Now, I would tell these climate change cultists to wake up and smell the coffee, but, well, you guessed it, folks. You're killing the planet when you kick back with that glorious morning cup of joe. You see, last month, researchers at the University of Quebec at Chicoutimi published a study calling for consumers to embrace an adapted diet in order to combat the effects of coffee preparation. Quote, limiting your contribution to climate change requires an adapted diet and coffee is no exception. Choosing a mode of coffee preparation that emits less greenhouse gases and moderating your consumption are part of the solution, the four researchers wrote, end quote. Folks, my love for coffee is surely right up there with how an alcoholic looks upon beer, wine, and spirits, which is to say it's an addiction. I cannot function without it. Now, I could prepare a concise intellectual response to these crackpot researchers in Chicoutimi, who I bet you anything were drinking copious quantities of coffee as they toiled over their research paper. But I'm a wee bit caffeine deprived today, so I'll let the late great Martin Landau deliver a, res a response to this proposed war on Java. Fuck you!
Now, folks, this crackpot give up your coffee demand was going to be my suggestion for my climate change jump the shark moment. But just days after the coffee study emerged, along came something even more insane. And it was crafted by a medical doctor, no less. Here goes, quote, Dr. Mohamed Fayed, an anesthesia resident physician at the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, presented a study he recently authored that analyzed how doctors could reduce anesthetics during surgery to reduce the carbon footprint of operating rooms worldwide during ASA's annual conference last week, end quote. Uh, folks, how would you like to go under the knife with this quack at your bedside? And what is the doc trying to fix here when it comes to carbon footprints? Because get this, inhaled anesthetics used during general anesthesia are estimated to be responsible for 0.01% to 0.10% of the total worldwide carbon dioxide equivalent emission. That's right, not even one half of 1%. Basically, Dr. Fayed wants you to suffer so that carbon dioxide goes down by an amount that doesn't even represent a rounding error. But you know something? Don't take my word for it that this lunatic suggestion is the jump the shark moment for climate change idiocy. Rather, consider what the American Society of Anesthesiologists did earlier this month. Namely, they wiped Dr. Fiad's study from its website. That study is now akin to that season of Dallas that never took place. It was all a dream, you see, or more like a nightmare, really. The official reason for the scrubbing of this nonsensical study is that it was inaccurate. But me being the cynic that I am, I think there was something more at play here when it came to deep sixing this pathetic paper. Namely, isn't an anesthesiologist slamming anesthesia, kind of like a dairy farmer denouncing milk, which is to say, I bet there were more than a few anesthesiologists who came to the conclusion that if anesthesia becomes this decade's version of DDT and is eventually done away with, well, connect the dots. Is there any future left for those pursuing a career as an anesthesiologist. That was an excerpt from the Ezra Levant Show. I'm Ezra Levant. Every weekday, I do a monologue about the topic of the day. Then I interview a fascinating guest, either in studio or via Skype. And then I read your mail, whether it's fan mail or hate mail, which is sometimes even more interesting. This is on our premium service, though, called Rebel News Plus. Go to rebelnewsplus.com. It's eight bucks a month or less if you buy a whole year in advance. You get my show every weeknight, plus Sheila Gunn Reed's show every week. It's called The Gun Show. It's pretty amazing. You know, we rely on you because we do not take a dime from the government. In Canada, that makes us almost unique. So please help us out and help yourself to some great journalism at rebelnewsplus.com.